I'm James Roy. I am a writer from the Blue Mountains. Today I'll be reading from the book that I wrote with my friend Noel Zihabamwe called 1000 Hills. It was published by Omnibus, which is a scholastic imprint, in, uh, in 2016. Uh, it tells a fictional account or fictionalised account of a, uh, a young boy, Pascal, who lives in Rwanda during the genocide events of 1994 and it is based loosely on my friend Noel's own personal story. So I'll just be reading from the beginning just for a few minutes. Monday the 15th of March 1999 Collège Secondaire de saint Mathieu, Brussels, Belgium. Are you comfortable there? I'm fine I guess. What happens now? You start talking. Do you need a glass of water before we begin? What do I talk about? Well, that all depends. What do you want to talk about? Nothing. I don't want to talk about anything. I told Monsieur Baum that already. Okay. Okay? Okay. So I don't have to talk if I don't want to? That's right. So we just sit here until recess? If I don't say anything, I mean. Yes, Pascal, if that's what you want to do. And then I'll go to recess and you'll go back to the staff room? Yes, yeah, something like that. Will you still get paid, even if I don't tell you anything? Will you still get paid? Yes, of course, don't worry about me. But I don't want you to get into trouble. It's very kind of you, Pascal, but it's fine, honestly. Who would I get in trouble with, anyway? Monsieur Baum? I don't have to worry about being called to the principal's office. Well, that's lucky for you. No, I did all that when I was in secondary school. I went to a Catholic school too, you know, but not this one. It was in France, actually. Did you get in trouble a lot? Not a lot, a bit, enough. What sort of thing did you do? Oh, you know, the usual. Did you ever smash another boy's head into a locker? No, no, I don't think I ever did that, but I remember that sometimes I felt like it. Sure you did. I did, sometimes. Well, I feel like it a lot. But this is the first time I did it, true. Do you want to talk about that? About how I feel? Not really. Okay. Are you even a real priest? Me? No, I'm not a priest at all, I'm just a counsellor. So you're not a priest? No, as I said, I'm a counsellor. Well, a child psychologist, actually. But, well, I'm not crazy. I know you're not crazy, Pascal. Why would you think... You said you're a psychologist. Yes, that's right. You might be thinking of something different. Anyway, just think of me as someone to listen to. That's all. If you talk, that is. Which you don't have to do. Okay. But I'll be honest, I am interested in something you said just a minute ago. Or rather, the way you said it. When you asked if I was a priest and I said I wasn't, you seemed relieved. I don't care if you're a priest. You don't? No, back in Agabundi I had friends who were priests. What were their names? Well, Father Oscar was my best priest friend. Were there others? Sure, but he was my favourite one. He used to talk to me a lot. His hand was all bent and twisted like this. For a while I thought about going to the seminary just because of him. Because I wanted to be like him. Do you still think about that? About going to the... the do you still think about that? Yeah. Do you still think about that? About going into the priesthood? Not anymore. Can you tell me why not? Because of Father Michel. Don't you mean Father Oscar? No, I meant Father Michel. I don't understand. It's a long story. I've got plenty of time. I've got all the time in the world. Agabunde, Musanza District, Northern Rwanda, April 1994. This story starts with a bell. There's also the slanting sun and the hawks overhead. The rooster and the goat and the town and the mist and the church above the clouds. There's the radio with its message that chilled the boy to the bone. The night in the broken water tank when the chickens were panicking outside and the water tasted like stale beer. Don't forget the mother and the father and the brother and the boy who was more like a brother and the sister. Baby too, please don't forget baby. Or the man who was an enemy before he was a friend even just for a little while. And there was the dying. Of course there's the dying. For many, that's all this was ever about. It's all it will ever be about until they can let it go, which is hard, very hard. Almost the hardest thing of all. But the bell, mostly the bell. For this child, the bell was everything. The beginning of it all, and in a way, the end of it all. At the beginning, in a sense, it heralded his first memory. Pascal's first proper memory, the bell ringing, swinging from its tall square frame, protected from the daily rain by a tiny pitched roof. 
watching one of the older boys ringing the bell, pulling down so hard on the thick rope that his feet were almost lifted off the ground with each upswing. The bell was a constant throughout his early life, as constant as his parents or his home or his town Agabande with the great strangler fig tree at its centre. The boy who rang the bell would get older and take on some new job at the seminary, an altar boy perhaps, or later a trainee priest. Feeling envious and hoping that boy would one day get bored with ringing the bell every Sunday. Hoping that he might move away to the city or even get so sick that he couldn't move. Pascal didn't want that other boy to die, not really, but he did long to be given that boy's terribly important job of ringing the bell for Jesus. Pascal loved Jesus. Jesus loved him in return, cared for him, had, had died to save him, which is the most loving thing anyone can do for another person. That's what Jesus had done. This is what his parents said. This is what Father Michelle and Father Oscar said. It was what Pascal believed. It was what he knew. He knew it better than almost anything. His eldest brother, Teribe, who had gone to study in Brussels, was the only person in Pascal's family who didn't believe in Jesus. Mama didn't like to talk about this unthinkable fact. It made her sad to talk about it, and Pascal knew this to be true, judging by the way Mama would get that certain look whenever anyone asked about Teribe. He's liking Brussels very much, Mama would say. He's studying hard and he works in a bar. But then she would clear her throat and look down at the ground, scratch her right eyebrow with her thumb, and it was time to change the subject. That's what smart people did. Sunday, the best day of all because of breakfast and Sunday school. Songs and stories and smiling faces. Wide, bright smiles on shining black faces. Maybe it was because of the white cloth against black skin that everything seemed more sensible on Sunday. Crisp and sharp like a clap of the hands. But Pascal also loved Sunday because the routine was different from the other six days of the week. On Sunday, it wasn't his brother's job to wake him up. The enjoyment Jean-Baptiste seemed to take each morning from pulling Pascal's blanket off and watching him curl up in a little complaining ball, it just wasn't right. Stop playing with your willy, his brother would say, laughing like a crazy person. It'll grow by itself. I'm not playing with my willy, Pascal would groan, pulling his blanket back over himself. Get lost or I'll tell Mama. Go on, I dare you. She's the one who told me to wake you up in the first place. Six mornings a week it was this way. Pascal waking up to something unpleasant. Sometimes cold water dripped on his face or being dragged out of bed by his big toes until his toe knuckles cracked. Once Jean-Baptiste put a broody hen in Pascal's bed. Another time it was a dead rat that the dog had brought inside. More than once he'd put his bum right over Pascal's face and let rip and Pascal had woken with a terrible pong burning the inside of his nostrils. To wake up before Jean-Baptiste so he could do something just as bad. That would be something. But Pascal always slept too well. This was why he always woke to something awful. But not on Sundays. Jean-Baptiste had to be up extra early on Sundays. He had a job to do over on the other side of the valley. Jean-Baptiste had to go and ring the church bell. As soon as Pascal was properly awake and while his little sister Nadine kept on snoring softly, he'd pull on his shorts and go out to the water tank to wash. Every morning was like this, even Sundays, the sun slanting golden through the banana trees behind the house and glistening off the dew on the grass. All the colours seemed so much brighter at that time of morning. The grass greener, the soil more red, the sky more blue. And the sounds, those early sounds, Mostly it was a rooster, Hugo, a noisy brute standing up there on the hen house, crowing with his head tipped way back. The red feathers around his neck puffed up, making him look twice as big. And loud, so loud, he'd just stand there and crow until all his hens were awake and gathering at the main gate. Then Pascal would set them free. They were all so serious as they charged into the yard to start their day of scratching and pecking. And it always made him smile, always. Other birds too. Tiny finches darting around in the bushes, making their little whistles and chirrups. Quail and guinea fowl and mouse birds scratching and fussing in the undergrowth, while overhead a hawk or two would crisscross the sky, looking down, seeing everything, watching for an opportunity. For Pascal, that part of every morning was the same as any other. Out of bed, let out the chickens, take the goat to a new part of the garden and tie her up, just out of reach of the beans or bananas or cassava or corn. Make sure that she and the cow had clean water. Milking the cow wasn't his job, that was one of Jean-Baptiste's chores six days a week. When all that was done, it was time to wash his face and hands because breakfast would soon be ready. Breakfast. Sorghum porridge, watered down milk, sometimes bread, never meat, usually sorghum. But on Sundays, breakfast was different. They drank proper milk for Sunday breakfast, no sorghum, no watered down milk, but the real thing. Full strength, creamy milk. They drank it from bowls, not cups. 
Mama always put some aside for Jean Baptiste. After all, he was over the other side of the valley ringing the church bell. Then instead of getting ready for school, Pascal would pull on his white shirt and navy blue shorts and get ready to walk to church with the sound of Jean Baptiste's bell calling him and his family down into the valley and up the other side of the seminary to the seminary church, which perched like heaven itself on top of the mist that lay heavy over the town. This town, small, clinging to the bottom of the crooked valley like grime in a fingerprint. The slopes in this part of the country were steep and the mountains were always in the edge of your view. The gorillas lived in those mountains and the tourists came to see the gorillas. They stayed in the lodge with the tall white fence and the metal gates and took photos of the town as they were driven through in their minibus. But they never stopped in town. They just took photos through the dusty windows of their minivans and safari trucks. Pascal had never been to see the gorillas. He didn't know anyone who had. One of his brother's friends, Kami, said that his father was a guide. And that may or may not have been true. Pascal didn't trust anything Kami said anyway. He'd been known to lie in the past. He was a snake, unable to be trusted, just like his younger brother, Paul. This town, with its handful of shops, the main street, its short section of tar, the only sealed road for kilometres in any direction, the only relief from the bone-juddering ruts and potholes, a thin, ragged strip of pavement along the middle of a much wider strip of dirt, dusty in the dry and muddy in the wet, padded free of grass and weeds by thousands of feet. What else in the town? A bar for the grown-ups. A small grocery store opposite the school and the giant strangler fig tree on the corner of the road that led up to the seminary and its church. The medical clinic beside Mr Ingabiro's store, run by Dr Singh and his wife who worked as a clinic nurse. The mechanic's garage with the stacks of broken motorcycles and worn tyres at the side. And behind the main row of shops was a market, a narrow sloping lane lined with stalls and faded umbrellas, all faintly tinted with red dust and peppered with stray dogs. Pascal's family lived high on the eastern side of the valley. From the front of their house they looked down on the roofs of the town and over the stripes of green terraces. Directly across the valley was a seminary. The church had once been white. Now when viewed from up close it was streaked by years of rain and red dust. But from Pascal's house it still appeared white, especially in the early morning. It stood out starkly against the bright green of the grass and trees and bushes and when the morning mist came through the valley and settled over the town like a steaming lake, the church floated above it like a ship. Tucked in behind the church was the seminary itself, two classrooms, a kitchen and a small dining room, the dormitory where the young trainee priests lived, Father Michelle's house with the office next door, and through a steel gate and a tall red brick fence was a compound where the nuns lived and worked. The nuns kept vegetable gardens and chickens. The priests kept goats and some cows. Everything was shared, but they never drank the milk they collected. They gave it all away, they gave it all away to the poor, all of it. They were servants of God, walking in Jesus' footsteps, following his example, caring for the people, all of the people, all of the people, men, women, children, Hutu, Tutsi, Twa, all of them. That's just the first chapter of 1000 Hills by James Roy and Noel Zihabamwe, published by Scholastic, Omnomus Books, an imprint of Scholastic Australia. Thanks for listening.